Eyewitness News is your local election headquarters. Tonight, live from our studios in East Providence, Democratic candidates for governor in their first televised debate. Good evening, I'm Tim White. Thank you for joining us. I will be moderating this exchange and asking questions along with my colleague, Eyewitness News reporter Ted Nisi. Now the criteria to be included in our debate is set by our parent company. Before we begin, I do want to note that we invited incumbent Governor Gina Raimondo to debate tonight, but her campaign declined our invitation. Joining us in studio, Democratic candidates for governor Matt Brown and Spencer Dickinson. Mr. Brown and Mr. Dickinson, thank you both for accepting our invitation. As always, with our debates, there is no strict format. We are looking for an open and honest discussion of the issues. If we feel you're not answering the question or you're taking too long, we will jump in. Now, to begin, each candidate gets a one-minute opening statement. The order was drawn randomly prior to this debate. First up, Mr. Dickinson, your one-minute opening statement. Thank you, and thank you very much for doing this. <clears throat> I kind of wish the uh, third chair were here to, to dramatize the fact that the governor is not here. And something you said that caught my attention, the parent company, and I didn't know that they uh, set the standards for the debate. I'd like, maybe later you can explain to me how that works. It kind of got my attention. Uh, as we do this debate, there's a couple of things that I'd just like to, you know, as, as, as an introduction, I just want to say um, how I see this whole thing. We're going to hear today about bold, <coughs> bold new ideas. We're going to hear about um, uh, working families. We're going to hear about health care. We're going to hear about some great ideas that may not be new ideas that I've been working on for years. And they're very important, and it's, it's time to start moving along on those things. Um, what I bring to it is experience, and I see that our time is running quickly to an end, but uh, I'm looking forward to the questions, and I really appreciate being included here. All right, Mr. Dickinson, thank you very much. Now, Mr. Brown, your one-minute opening statement. The system we have isn't working for Rhode Islanders, but I have hope that we can change it. I know that we are better than the system that we've created. We love our children so much we would die for them, but we've created a system where children go hungry and without health care and where the school buildings are falling down around them. We love justice, but we've created a system where 20 people in this country own as much wealth as the 152 million in the bottom half. We love nature but we've created a system that is destroying it. And we love democracy, but our democracy is so corrupted by the influence of money that it no longer works for the people. I know we can have a state that reflects our values. We can have a state where everyone can afford to go to the doctor without going broke, where all of our children can get a quality education regardless of their zip code, where everyone can have a job that pays and a home they can afford. We can do all of these things. I've spent my life running public service organizations that have gotten results to improve people's lives, and that's what I'll do as your governor. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Let's begin with our first question. Um, governor Mundo had a 76% favorable rating with Democrats in our most recent Eyewitness News Roger Williams University poll. And as you both know, she's been very successful at raising a lot of money. But we also know there are some voters who, would, who are looking for an alternative to Governor Raimondo going into the primary. And the school of thought is, is the two of you are just splitting that alternative vote. Mr. Dickinson, I'll, I'll start with you. We heard from you at the, uh, in your opening statement why you would be the right choice or why you feel you'd be the right choice. What would you say to voters who support Mr. Brown as to why he's the wrong choice on well, September 12th? You've raised a very good question because what we have here today is a job interview. We're the two candidates. The third candidate didn't show up. And the people of Rhode Island have to select who the, who the next governor is going to be. Tonight, what you're doing effectively is selecting between me and Matt as to who should be the one that in effect challenges her because that's the real race as I see it. The numbers, the statistics, the polling, I think it, you know, even with uh, two or three weeks to go, I don't think that's the question. Uh, polling, it, it shouldn't be about polling. I want to I talk to hosts and uh, guest hosts who, who ask, uh, not uh, what is the content of your bank account, but what is the content of your character. It shouldn't be about polling. It shouldn't be about your campaign finance, uh, your, your war chest. It should be about what kind of a governor We know about you Governor Raimondo. The question is, why is Mr. Brown the wrong candidate to uh, challenge the governor in the primary? Or why are you the right one? Well, let me start with the first part of your question. Uh, if Gina were here, apparently she has weighed in on this issue, and some of you may have gotten this in the mail. I'll set that down on the table in front of Gina. There's not much we can do with a prop, Mr. Spencer, so, uh, Mr. Dickinson, so well, continue but, with your answer. But the record shows that I have a document here. Um, 
profile, open it up, some issues. Effectively, many people, certainly many Democrats that are going to be voting the primary have seen this. There's some issues raised here. And somebody said, well, you know, is it the pot calling the kettle black? Well, to me, it is. Uh, but on the other hand, it illustrates the point that from my perspective, Gino Raimondo and Matt Brown are in effect the same candidate. And we hear certain things from him, but in terms of actual outcome, I think there's a difference. Uh, I bring the fact that I'm not new. I bring the fact that Gina and I have been actually on the opposite sides. She was involved in pension reform. I was probably her chief, if not one of her chief opponents on that. We go back a long time. Uh, I was involved in preparing to do a serious 38 Studios investigation. She thwarted it. Right. She promised it. Thank and you, didn't Mr. Dickens. And Mr. Brown, he says you and the governor are essentially the same candidate. Well, look, here's, here's what I think. To me, what this campaign is about is that we've got a system that is broken for people across this state. Uh, the cost of things people need, health care, housing, child care, education, have gone through the roof for a long time. Uh, and the wages people have made have stayed the same. That means life is getting harder and the government isn't doing anything about it. And the reason it's not doing anything about it is because our government uh, is working for corporations, Wall Street, and the wealthiest 1%. And I believe that Governor Mundo is very much part of that system and taking it to an extreme. Uh, I believe that government has one job and one job only in a democracy and that's to look out for the people. That's what I've done my whole life. I've spent my whole life starting and running organizations. Mr. Brown, to look out I, I, it sounds like state. another opening statement coming from you. The, the, we, do you agree that the two of you split the alternative vote for, for Governor Raimondo? Do you believe in that school of thought? Well, that's going to be up to the voters. What I'm here to talk about is what I think the problems are that they're facing and my ideas for how to solve those problems. That's what the campaign ought to be about. And why do you think Mr. Dickinson would be the wrong choice on September 12th? Well, I'm not really focused on that. I mean, what I, people here are really... Shouldn't you be? Struck, no, I think what I need to be focused on is talking to the voters of this state, which is what I've been doing for the last several months, and what I've spent most of my life working on, working to strengthen our communities, going back to City Year, where we tutored thousands of kids in schools, served as the model for AmeriCorps, and has engaged a million people in community service across the state, running Global Zero to make the world safer and reduce nuclear arms, serving as Secretary of State. So I'm talking about my record and more importantly listening to the voters of this state about what their challenges are and sharing with them my ideas about how we can lower the cost of health care and improve schools for people and solve the problems that people are facing in this state. That's what the campaign ought to be about. That's what my campaign is about. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Ted. Let's turn to health care. You just mentioned it there, uh, Mr. Brown, so I'll stick with you. You want Rhode Island government to create what you call a statewide Medicare plan to cover health care for residents. Vermont spent four years trying to create a single-payer health plan and abandoned the idea after after the governor found it would nearly double the size of the state budget, he specifically said small states can't do single payer on their own. Shouldn't you listen to him since he actually tried it? Well, the system we have now is not realistic. It's not working. It needs to be changed. The, co the cost of health care has gone up 5% a year for 40 years now. 40,000 people in the state don't have any health insurance. Many who do can still not afford to go to a doctor. So this system isn't working. On top of that, of course, Governor Raimondo cut Medicaid. Uh, hurt nursing homes which had to close. People were forced out of their, their nursing homes. The hospitals are looking at closing here. So we've got a broken system and we need to do something new. And we know what works. We know it from Medicare, which has about 50 million members across the state, participants, most popular health care program in the state, lower administrative costs. Everyone is covered, so we know where we need to get. It's not easy to get from here to there. I understand the concerns that they have in Vermont, but we need to figure it out. And I've proposed that we do a commission with experts, I've already been talking to experts, and map out <clears throat> all the challenges and all the solutions to get from where we are to a health care system where, th where everyone can see a doctor and where everyone can be covered. Vermont's governor concluded he would need a payroll tax of 11.5% on businesses and an additional income tax of up to 9.5% on households to finance single payer there. Would that be the level of tax rates you think would be necessary in Rhode Island if your plan went through? Look, my plans overall will save money. We know this about a single payer system. Overall, it will save about $1,500 per person. The reason the system we have now is so expensive is because of the profiteering from the private health insurance companies. Take that out of the system, overall you have savings. Now there are a number of ways to get there and to create it, and as I said, we'll start a commission work through the ways that work best for Rhode Island and Rhode Islanders. And that commission, by the way, will not be in the state house. It's something we'll take across the state to hear the concerns of Rhode Islanders and what they want from a health care system. Mr. Dickinson, your website is less specific about your health care plan, but you do talk about pursuing universal health care. Do you think uh, Mr. Brown's plan to get to single-payer health care in Rhode Island is feasible? I think it's 
his concept are, are correct. Uh, I would take a slightly different approach. Uh, the administration would put the resources of the administration behind a, whatever it takes. Uh, it, could, it could be initiated, initiated by the legislature, it could be initiated by the governor's office, probably it should be both. But you know, I'll underline it, uh, we are spending 25 to 30 percent of our health care budget on administrative costs, profit, and pharma that we probably shouldn't be. So it's going to save us money and it's something the business community probably would benefit from because it would uh, make it a lot easier for people to move from job to job and it would give people secure health care. I don't think there's any dispute about that. I think the difference here is between me and him, uh, who's had the experience, who's been here, who knows the players, and who's actually going to do it as opposed to who can put it in a, you know, I may not express it as well, I'm going to give him credit for that, but I'm serious about it and I've been there and I've done it and I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, yeah. Mr. Brown, go ahead. Well, the other thing that's important to look at here is what 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 is what are our overall plans and what do they do in terms of uh, the fiscal health and the finances of the state? Because right now we're looking at <coughs> another $158 million deficit coming up down the road. And I would argue that uh, the problem with the finances in Rhode Island is partly a problem of priorities. That Governor Raimondo has been focused on giving, taking money from the taxpayers who can barely rub two dimes together in a lot of cases or are really struggling and giving it to individual corporations that are often her corporate donors that already have all the money in the world. Uh, secondly is just management problems. If you look at UHIP, Governor Raimondo launched UHIP when the federal government and the inspector general told her it wasn't ready. And the result is tens of thousands of people went hungry and without health care. And it, the bill is now $650 million. So All we right, can Mr. find a lot of savings through good management. Mr. Brown, Mr. Kinsella, I'll give you the final thought before we move on. Uh, he's right about that. Uh, the governor is a bad manager. The whole idea of spending $650 million on UHIP, uh, that's a lot of money. That could go into a lot of other good programs. Um, we have a, you know, it's a smaller example, but we've got the registry of motor vehicles. It's, it's uh, the consumer face of Rhode Island. It's not run right. And I think the problem there is that she never did an apprenticeship in issues that involve, say, systems. Uh, I was a systems analyst at Prudential Insurance in Boston, a big company. Then I moved to, I did the same job at Citizens Bank in Providence. Uh, I've been 12 years in the legislature, and I know the specifics about how to deal with this stuff. It's not just saying that it needs to be done, it's knowing where to go to start to get it done. And I think that's what I bring, that's what I'm trying to bring to this job interview. All right, Mr. Dickinson, thank you. We're going to do a <coughs> rapid fire section now to get through some topics quickly. And for both of you, I am looking for a one word answer on these questions. And Mr. Brown, we're going to start with you on the first question. Rhode Island lawmakers are considering a bill called the Reproductive Health Care Act, which would codify abortion rights in state law. As governor, would you sign or veto this bill? Sign it. Mr. Dickinson. I will support that bill if it's brought to me by the women legislators of the, of our General Assembly. Uh, you had, and I would encourage them to put you together You have a few the more than one like. word answer on that. Well, yes I don't or no. do one word yes, answer. So, well, we'll find out. Yes or no, uh, Mr. Dickinson, do you support continuing contracts for public sector unions? Uh, I, I support the Evergreen concept and in effect yes. Okay. Mr. Brown. Yes. You yes, you do. Uh, Mr. Brown, to you, should uh, Rhode Island legalize recreational marijuana? Yes. Mr. Dickinson. It's time to look at that seriously. It's something the legislature has to do. It's well, We've come a long way in that direction. So time you're to open to it. it is what open you're to it. Okay. Um, if it's not you, Mr. Dickinson, if it's not you, will you endorse the winner of the Democratic primary? I already said I don't see a big difference between my opponent here and Gina Raimondo, so I'm afraid the answer would have to be no. Uh, how about you, Mr. <coughs> Brown? If it's not you, will you endorse the winner of the Democratic primary? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Brown, final rapid-fire question here. <coughs> if he wins re-election in District 15, do you support giving Nicholas Mattiello a new term as the Speaker of the House in January? Not up to me. That's the legislator's prerogative. Do you yeah. think his his leadership is good for Rhode Island? Yes or no? Um, well, again, that's up. That's going to be up to the the voters in his district and the uh, and his caucus. Uh, Mr. Dickinson, if he wins uh, in November, do you support giving Nicholas Mattiello a new uh, term? He and I have had serious issues. He knows sure. that, and uh, I I have to tell you that not every promise he made me was kept. But I will get along well with Nick Mattiello and every legislator. So you support him becoming well, Speaker? Well, I, I, I don't make that decision, but if he is the Speaker, we'll get along. All right. Ted? 
Both of you have made uh, criticism of Governor Raimondo's 2011 pension overhaul, a focus in your campaigns. I believe, Mr. Dickinson, you already alluded to it. Uh, Mr. Brown, you've promised to restore cost of living adjustments, or COLAs, for state retirees, which were suspended under that law. Rhode Island's current unfunded liability for its biggest pension funds is estimated at 5.3 billion dollars. How much do you estimate the shortfall would be if you do decide to restore COLAs entirely? Well, there are a number of ways to do this. The commitment I've made is to get something back in terms of an annual pension increase. And we've got to go back and look at how we ended up in this situation in the first place. So in 2011, there were some things that needed to be done to shore up the pension system. But what Governor Raimondo did, the drastic and sudden cuts to people who had paid into this system with their own money, who had made life plans with this system, when they were going to retire, where they were going to send their kids to college, if they were going to own a home. Those drastic and sudden cuts hurt a lot of people across the state. Those drastic cuts were not necessary. Then on top of that, she took the pension fund and invested it in high risk, high fee hedge funds that then essentially lost the state $715 million by underperforming in the market and with the $200 million in high fees uh, to the hedge funds. So it was, in the end, uh, uh, cuts for working people in Rhode Island and a huge boon for Wall Street. And so you talk about your plan. You yeah. Summarize well, your case against that. So what you will do if you're governor? Well, that's what, what's important to understand about that is a lot of the money that was supposed to have been saved was just shifted to Wall Street and lost. So what we need to do is take some of this back for the people who would have been made a promise and had a guarantee. And my commitment, there are a number of ways to do it, but my commitment is to get something back on an annual basis in terms of a pension increase for those people. And no specifics yet on and whether it will be the old COLA that they had under the pre-2011 system. We're open to a variety of options and we'll look at them. Mr. Dickinson, you were in the legislature. Um, I remember covering you during that debate. You voted against the 2011 pension law, very critical of it. Uh, what do you think can and, be and done? By the way, I did more than that. I proposed an amendment the night that we passed that bill. My amendment was gaveled down to the point that the speaker wouldn't even hear it. And the reason he didn't want to hear it was because it established a basis in law for the challenge of, of the bill. And, uh, we should say that was Speaker Gordon you, Fox That at was the Gordon time. Fox, and if you go to the journal for that night, you'll find that the information, including the LC number, mysteriously isn't there. I've lived this issue. Uh, what would I do about the COLAs? Uh, we can't necessarily get back the money we've lost. And w there might have been somewhere around $700 million that went to Wall Street and shouldn't have. Uh, there is a possibility of getting that back. I'm proposing that private individuals supported by the governor and the administration sue 50 Wall Street hedge fund managers and the governor, as they're doing now in the state of Kentucky, and possibly get some money back, maybe all of it. But that's a serious lawsuit, and I see Ted Seidel as being part of that lawsuit. Uh, with or without the success of that lawsuit, I think we should have a goal of putting the COLAs back where they, not where they, were, not where they were, but to put them where they would be if, in other words, if you've been going up the, the scale, uh, over the seven years since that bill was passed, if you'd be here then, this is where you'd still be there. You might have missed what happened in between, but let's say you had a $38,000 uh, retirement. Now you might be at 48. That I think is doable, and I have an idea what the what the cost might be. I'm going to just take a wild guess, uh, maybe 1.2 billion. But that didn't have to happen, and with the budget that we have and the fact that we owe some responsibility and loyalty to our state employees and, the, and our teachers and something else we, that people have Mr. Dickinson, about. I'll give you about 15 seconds to wrap up All right, your let thought me, here. Let me, let me try to make that we need to hire a whole new generation of excellent teachers and state employees, and we need a compensation package which, can, which is going to make that possible. And unless they trust us and unless they see that COLA there, uh, we're going to have trouble hiring those good people. All right, if you're just joining us, you are watching a Democratic primary debate for governor. Incumbent Governor Gina Raimondo declined our invitation to be here. I want to ask a question now on education. Big topic affects a lot of people in this state. Mr. Brown, we'll start with you. Same region, same population uh, demographics, active teachers union. But Massachusetts has a world-class public ed education system, and Rhode Island is in the middle of the pack. Uh, what do you view as the single biggest thing holding back Rhode Island's K-12 through public education system? Well, that's an excellent and, and critical question. I've been working in the schools going back to city year 25 years ago where we tutored children in the schools, and we were sadly mm -hmm. having the same conversations then that we're having 20 years later, which is why in this state can't we get a school system where we can give every single kid a good education? We ought to be able to do it, especially in a, in a state this size. Uh, not every problem uh, is caused by a shortage of money, but that's a big part of it. So in this state, 
Uh, we have made a big mistake over the last 20 years and straight through with Governor Raimondo's agenda, which is to just pile uh, extreme corporate tax cuts and tax cuts for the wealthiest 1%, that's people making over $500,000 approximately, piled one on top of the other, now piled on with a tax cut from Trump that went almost entirely to corporations and the wealthiest 1%. That money has come out of our school system. So Rhode Island at the state level is not fully funding our schools. This is why the school buildings are falling down. This is why we're not providing a quality education to all of our kids. This is why we're 50th out of the 50 states for the education of Latino children and worse for Rhode other Island minorities. Rhode Island has increased its uh, state funding to K through 12 systems over, over recent years. It hasn't been on the decline. Yeah, this is a, well, this is a drop in the bucket in the bigger picture of a shift that we've seen in this state and in the country of taking money from working people, middle class people, and shifting it to corporations and the wealthiest 1%. When we cut those taxes on the wealthiest and on the corporations, what happens? The children don't disappear. The local cities and towns uh, are compelled to raise property taxes, which hit the middle class harder. And they can't come up with the money. So our school system struggles. So I have called for cutting those extreme tax breaks that have been given to corporations and the wealthiest 1% and investing it in our schools. We now live in a situation in the state where the wealthiest pay the lowest tax rate of anyone. That's not fair and it's not fair to the kids Let in me put schools. a period at the end of the sentence with you, Mr. Yeah. Brown, here. Some uh, education professionals feel that Rhode Island needs to um, to change the Constitution, to codify the right to a public education through a voter referendum and that would be the path forward to changing how schools are funded. Would you support um, a referendum to change the cons uh, the state constitution to well, codify public education. Well, boy, I think that would be it's a, a to me a sign of a failure of leadership of this state if we can't fix our schools without forcing it into the constitution. I mean, we need to just take. Well, that had to happen. That had to happen in Massachusetts. It had to be a Supreme Court. Yeah, no, court no, decision. I get that, but I, I hope we don't have to get there. We ought to be able to do it because it's the right thing to do. We ought to be able to do it because we're clear that government has one job, and that's to look out for the people, not for corporations and Wall Street and the wealthiest. All right, Mr. Dickinson, let me remind you of the original question, which summed up is what do you view as the single biggest biggest thing holding back Rhode Island's K through 12 public education system? Well, we don't uh, take seriously or we don't put enough emphasis on say gr age four through grade three and I think that's where it starts and I have a very specific proposal and it relates to the fact that it, it even ties into the threat of the Providence bankruptcy and that is that we should we should address the issue of Providence and Central Falls and Pawtucket maybe have a a unified uh, laboratory school district and put serious emphasis into uh, age four through grade three. If you aren't reading and doing arithmetic at grade three, you will not do high school chemistry. You will not, say, go to college and be a pharmacist or many other opportunities. So I think it starts there and we're going to have to spend, we have to recognize the fact that Providence has a unique challenge and we have to spend some money and I think, you know, I'd be an advocate for that. It may not be something that the rest of the state wants to hear. But uh, we have to explain that this is, this is where you start. If it works in, say, Providence, Central Falls, and Pawtucket, uh, then this is something the whole state could adopt. But I'd like to see it as a laboratory school system. And there are two, there are two uh, systems that I'm aware of. What they did in Oklahoma, where they did this experiment beginning with age four, and it worked. And age four students, they're not dragged into school, but it's optional. They are taught by certified teachers. There's the Finland plan. Uh, I can see we're running out of time here, but I recommend read that book, Finish Lessons. Believe right. it or not, gentlemen, we only have five minutes left in the debate, so I do want to get to another issue. Uh, I'll stick with Mr. Dickinson. Uh, I'll keep it simple. What do you consider your number one policy idea that will create more jobs in Rhode Island? Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing. I think we just have to knuckle down and, and do it differently. Uh, one of our problems is that we are known as the pay-to-pay <coughs> state. And I would like to completely reorganize the so-called Commerce Corporation, put it back where it was when Gordon Fox got embarrassed by 38 Studios and had to change the name. Uh, I might even like to see a couple of state troopers full-time at the Department of Economic Development and they'd be looking for pay-to-play stories. Now, if people come to, and I've heard these stories, and we all have if you've been around here for a while, business people come here from out of state, they're told, you're gonna, you're gonna have to uh, give a, you know, you're gonna have to make a, you're gonna have to hire a law firm, you're gonna have to hire this engineering firm to get you through the ordinances. 
Once they hear that, they're gone. And then they're on the golf course telling their friends, don't go to Rhode Island. It's a pay-to-play pay -to -play state. That's the single most important thing that we need to change. Yes. And yes. It, it ties into we've got to get back and look at and fix the 38 studios Thank problem. you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Brown, same question. What do you consider your number one policy idea that will create more jobs in Rhode Island? Well, we've got to stop with this idea that Governor Raimondo's had that economic development is taking money from the hard work and taxpayers of the state and shifting it to corporations through corporate handouts, often to corporations that are her campaign donors. Instead, we need to make this a state where businesses want to come and they want to grow and they want to stay. What businesses are looking for are good schools for their kids, houses that their employees can afford, uh, good infrastructure, roads that aren't broken, and good governance. Rhode Island doesn't have any of those four. I want to solve those problems and make this a state, especially for our small businesses, where they want to come here, they want to grow, and they Can want to stay. Can you pick out, you have a lot of policy white papers on your website, sure. one specific for voters to hold on to from tonight. Yeah, we should block this frack gas plant that Governor Raimondo has been calling for that would pollute the state, it would harm our health, it would harm the children, be bad for the environment, be bad for the future. It's not good for anyone except that Invenergy Corporation uh, and, and Governor Raimondo, who took campaign, campaign contributions for them. Instead, let's make Rhode Island the first fully clean energy in the state, uh, in the country. Let's do it by 2030 and create 11,000 jobs in the process. You both have been critical of the tax incentive program out of the uh, Commerce Corporation. And since you brought it up, Mr. Brown, um, you know, the governor, I'm sure, if she were in the studio right now debating you, she would, she would uh, point out that thousands of jobs have come to Rhode Island through that program, luring companies like GE, Johnson & Johnson, Virgin Pulse, <coughs> Emphasis. Um, they, they would not have come without that tax incentive program. We're, we're short on time, but why is she wrong? Well, there's a lot of evidence from experts that that's just not true. That, as I said, companies are multi-billion dollar corporations paying their CEOs multi-million dollars, tens of millions of dollars a year. They're not making a decision based on ten millions of dollars that Governor Raimondo takes from the taxpayers and gives to them. They're looking for a place where their employees can have schools and their, their people can have housing they can afford good governance, that's what they're looking for. And that's what I want to give them, which would solve problems for the people in the state and also be a groundwork for strong economic development. Mr. Dickinson? The worst signal we can give is that we're paying people to bring jobs here. And every time there's a ribbon cutting, I think there should be another ceremony to, to celebrate the fact, or at least acknowledge the fact, some company is leaving the state. Uh, much of what he says is true. Every time that we, so we every year we export $4 billion in energy, uh, we can build wind farms, we can build wind towers, we can do offshore wind, we can replace our use of energy by energy that we make ourselves, and when we do, manufacturing will come back to Rhode Island, and we'll have a wealthy state as a result. But I also think at the same time we've got to watch our taxes. I don't agree with him that raising taxes is the answer. I think when we do that, uh, you know, we, we send a signal that we don't want you, and I it's, don't think that's the signal we should send. just have to say, it's not quickly. about raising taxes, it's about who's bearing the tax burden. <clears throat> and I think that all the breaks have gone to corporations and the wealthiest 1%, and the middle class have seen their taxes go up. That's not fair, and that needs to change. All right, 30 seconds left. Uh, Mr. Brown, who do you think was the best Rhode Island governor in the last 50 years? <laughs> uh, Oh, boy. Well, I don't know if I'm going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I, I will say I very much appreciate Governor Chafee's support. I think he's a very honest and good and ethical man. All right, Mr. Dickinson, very briefly. I liked uh, Joe Garrity because uh, there was a lot of good feeling when he was here, and people worked together, and, uh, you know, we didn't have what we have today, which is uh, in incompetence and bad decision making based on people making money for themselves. All right, Mr. Brown, Mr. Dickinson, thank you very much for joining us. A reminder, Governor Raimondo declined to join us in the studio. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. If you missed any of this uh, debate, it will be online. And thank you for watching. Tim, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.